the 7th of November 2023. Here, welcome back to the channel. Um, this is on a little bit of the history of the Gardaí, the political context of the policing in Ireland and of successive commissioners. And there's currently a recruiting campaign on. And by right, I should be giving some advice to people on the idea of choosing it, of choosing it as a career. Now, in 1916, there was the rebellion. The leaders were executed. There was a war of independence led mostly by General Michael Collins, who was extremely effective, ruthless when he had to be, but he tried to contain being ruthless as much as possible. And then he was shot, as I have always said, if you are involved in something and trying to build something, as soon as money comes into it, you'll find that there'll be a rebellion against you and they'll do something, mightn't kill you, but they kill Collins. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. A sort of, there, there's two parties came out of it. The pro-treaty, which was Fine Gael, and the anti-treaty, which was Fianna Fáil. And they were the two main parties. There was a Labour Party for a while. And Fine Gael was seen as the big for this party, the big farmers party, uh, the, the well-to-do and all that, but also being very strict and, and not suffering any fools lightly and not being big on social welfare, given social welfare and all this. They were seen as conservative like that. Fianna Fáil was seen as being like the British Labour Party, more for the small man, the working man. They gave free beef during the war. They done a lot of stuff like that. But they were also seen as the party of patronage, who you know is what you know, big time. Whereas Fine Gael would have been trying to have it a rules-based system. Fianna Fáil wanted the party and their hacks to give all the good jobs to all their own crowd. And there was a bit of that didn't mean that when Fianna Fáil was in power, a Fine Gael linked guard couldn't get promoted or vice versa, but it did help a bit. We're going to take a look at some of the commissioners. It's important to understand the historical context. The headquarters is in the Phoenix Park in Dublin. It's a big police force as they go. There's something like 43 police forces in, in, in the UK, in, in England, in England, I think, alone. Um, there's a, there was 9,000 in it uh, way back. Now there's about 13 in the Garda Shikana. Now that is an unbelievable workload for a commissioner to have to handle. But you're going to have people being sacked, people who do wrong, um, challenges, legal challenges, where you post where you station people. It is not easy running a big force like that. Many would say that's not how it should be run at all, that each uh, election division, each constituency should have its own police force. That's how it is in England, but I'm not saying. Now, at the time before the state came in, there was the, there was the DMP, the Dublin Metropolitan Police, and then there was the Garda Shikon, the sorry, 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 the DMP, and then there was the, the RIC in, outside of Dublin, okay? And RIC was the police force for all of Ireland, and they too were trained in the Phoenix Park in Dublin, okay? So the Phoenix Park was back a long way. So the first commissioner was Michael Staines, and he had been involved in the in the War of Independence and all that stuff, and uh, he uh, didn't serve too long, only only a while. Now, Owner Duffy took over in September 22. Oh, by the way, Michael Staines was the man that introduced the concept of unarmed guards. At the moment, detectives are authorised to carry guns if they have their course passed and if they're qualified, and the uniformed guards don't carry them except for very unique specialised units that are specially designed and come specially. The ordinary guard going around um, uh, 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 doing an inquiry or something does not carry weapons, whereas the detective ha should carry them, is supposed to carry them, they don't always carry them. Right? The two weapons mainly are the Uzi submachine gun, an Israeli um, designed and manufactured submachine gun, although some are manufactured in Belgium. But, and the other one is the Smith & Wesson uh, Military and Police 38 Special Revolver. There is a, There are other semi-automatic weapons as well among specialised units. That's all we need to know. So anyway, that was Michael Staines, and he said we'll, we'll succeed by, the, by, our, by public support, not by a force of arms. 
And so he, he was an architect of that, even though he was only there a very short time. I don't think there's any, I don't think there's, any, and there is a picture of him in a kind of a semi-uniform. -uni Owner Duffy was very important to understand, 1922 to 1938, sorry, 1922 to 1933, 1933, and he was more or less sacked. He was the blue shirt, he was strongly connected with the, with the struggle in uh, in uh, Monaghan and Armagh, with the independence struggle, and he was pro-treaty, which put him into the Fine Gael side, and uh, he actually uh, was a successful enough commissioner in difficult times, but he, he, he started, when, when he started, he was very much right-wing, and eventually uh, Fianna Fáil got into power, Fianna Fáil, I think it was 1932, they got in and they had a purge. They got rid of an awful lot of the Fine Gael type officers that were there, chief superintendents. Some of them were sacked and superintendents were sacked. They got rid of an awful lot, a purge that was carried out and they installed their own type of people. De Valera became the prime minister and De Valera was the prime minister during the economic war and during the second world war. He was Fianna Fáil. Now the next fellow then was Eamon Broy, and he was a, a, a British uh, official police um, security, what do you call it, detective in Dublin Castle. But he, he secretly joined Collins and he was given secret uh, lists of people out through intermediaries to Collins. And some of those were shot dead. They were shot dead. Uh, 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 there were G-men, they called them. There were British uh, police detectives and their job was to gather information and all of that on on IRA and all that the the the, the Collins's crowd and uh, he gave out the, the the lists and Collins had a good few of them shot dead and that was a severe severe blow to Britain they couldn't they couldn't operate then the, the, the top men were gone but that's what Bry did but Bry later was the commissioner and he they had them called the Bry Harriers there was some trouble down in Kerry and he had a special group and he went down and he was not popular. He was very, 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 very austere uh, kind of a character, Eamon Broy. In any event, he lasted five years and he was gone in 1938. Michael Kinnan, uh, that he was, I don't know much about him, 1938 to 1952, never, I never heard. Kinnan is a Mayo name, don't know much about him. Daniel Costigan, in 1952, following Kinnan, the government decided to appoint a civilian, a civil service, servant to the job of the Garda Shikana. In other words, up to that, it was all as a, a pre-existing policeman got the job, a high-ranking officer got the job as commissioner, but um, Daniel Costigan was a civilian. And Drew Harris, although a former policeman, is not a former Irish policeman, so he's the second for that to happen. So Costigan apparently was there from 52 to 65, and he wasn't he wasn't a bad commissioner, though there was a lot of good good said about him in the Times. William P. Quinn took over in 65 from Costigan until 1967. He was two years in the Garda Commissioner. And uh, he did try to begin books and manuals to try and guide them along. He was from Inneskeen in Monaghan. I think he had connections in Kingscourt too, where the, some of the family were blacksmiths and, and all that. But funny how he got on so well, William P. Quinn, but he was the Commissioner anyway. He only served two years, fair enough. And the next fellow was Patrick Malone, now, I don't know where he, I think he was from Louth, Patrick Malone. Patrick Malone was a very austere, oh, regimental type of a man. And it used to be said that he was stationed in County Mayo. And he, all, all these people, to get up through the ranks, they had to prove they were, they were ruthless. And this comes in an awful lot in the Garda Shikona. And it's something any new recruit will notice. There's constant pressure to have that book full and get people to the courts. The solicitors are depending on prosecutions. The courts are depending on prosecutions to give up the numbers, especially small courts. They need a big turnover of, 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 of cases. And the poor old motorist or unfortunate civilian is at the bottom of it, and it'll always be the, the least well off that'll be prosecuted and all that. But that has to be a certain amount of, of, of law and order, as we say, and road traffic. And road traffic changed the complexion of the guards, unbelievably. Everywhere road traffic came in, it increased the ways a, a poor old ordinary person could get into court and be prosecuted and fined by about 5,000. I mean, before that, you might be caught for having no license on an old gun or something, or you might be caught making putching. You might have no name on your horse and cart or something, but it was very hard to get prosecuted. 
But what's a car came in? My God, it was very, very simple. So this was used then as a stepping stone because all the senior officers wanted and all the government wanted, they wanted prosecutions. And this, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with it. It just brings home, and I'm absolutely convinced, government hates the people. Government, very, very few governments like, like the people. They hate the people. No. So then Patrick Carroll, yeah, Patrick Carroll introduced the Guard the Guide, which is a very good legal document, a very, very good, very, very good legal document. And he wasn't bad. He, he was a good commissioner. He was a good commissioner, all told, uh, uh, um, having repl and he replaced, he replaced uh, Quinn, who in turn replaced Costigan. So all told, um, um, there was very regimental discipline. I mean, up until now, guards who weren't married had to get permission to be married, and they had to attach twenty pounds to show they were solvent. And they had to, uh, if they were in official quarters, there were seriously strict rules. Serious strict rules. I mean, they'd go around. Just the superintendent would check the beds and all in the morning, and they'd find them. And there's very, very many examples of um, guards in their fifties being fined for not having their bed made in a station. So maybe they had to have that. I don't know. Maybe they had. I'm only telling you the times it's in it. The next fellow came along was Michael Wimes, 1968 to 1973. Rather uneventful character. Don't think there's much known. That, now, so, so now, now just, just to list them again now here, in case I confused you, the list again, and it's easy to get confused, was Staines, O'Duffy, Broy, Michael Kinnan, Daniel Costigan. William P. Quinn, Patrick Carroll, Michael Wimes, Patrick Malone. Malone, won, oh yeah, I meant to say about Malone. He actually is supposed to have prosecuted his own wife. Uh, he was out on patrol over the west of Ireland and two ladies came down the street and they had no lights on the bike. It got dark. They spent too long chatting somewhere and he stepped out and he stopped them. And one of them turned out to be his wife. And the wife had, had no taillight, but she had a headlight. But the other one had neither taillight nor headlight. So he said he couldn't prosecute the other one and let his own wife away, so he prosecuted both. That That is very, I believe that to be true. He prosecuted the wife and the wife's friend. <laughs> he was he was a very um, righteous, rules means rules type of a man. In any event, God be good, I think they're all dead up to now. Next man was Edwin Garvey, and he was from Ballinlock in County Roscommon. Oh my God, he was Fina, Fina Gale, Fina Gale, Patrick Cooney was the minister and he was a serious problem with the IRA causing mayhem in the country and fighting wars. But at the same time, this was taken as a reason to clamp down on everybody. And you had a Labour Fine Gael government with Patrick Cooney uh, as Minister for Justice and he appointed Garvey and Garvey was a rigid disciplinarian. Now, one of the things that helped to get Gar Garvey promoted, he was always in Dublin. He was in the detective branch. He was a detective sergeant and a detective inspector and all of this. But he was big involved in the formation of the Garda Club in Dublin. That's a club where you can go in and get dinner and all of that. It's open to the public too, and um, a drink and all of that, and sports and all that. And he, he could motivate a lot of men to come off duty and help do work to build the Garda Club at Harrington Street. Now, it's a big issue, and I don't think it's a right issue, that being big into sports in the guards is seen as a major stepping stone for promotion. I just cannot see how somebody that can score, score a goal from well out the field or score a point, it should be the right person to run a police force or to make decisions on, on staffing and all of that and promotion. In the guards in the early years, the church religion was a, a major stepping stone for promotion. And second, secondly, was sports. The Gunnar Brady, God be good to him, great man he was. Mick Higgins, all very nice people, all got up, up reasonably well. And it got stations to suit them. And, and, and that, that applies, uh, that applied a lot. Whether, uh, whether it's a good idea or not. What if a fellow's a good boxer, I mean. He boxes away. Should he be the commissioner? I, I just don't get that now. I miss something missing on me. Anyway, Garvey took out. He launched a campaign going round the country. He would come unannounced to a station. He'd search the station and check the beds and check everything, how they were, and he'd have all uh, the uh, superintendent with him. And the superintendent would have to follow up all this and institute disciplinary proceedings. 
and everything. And he'd be above in Dublin and he'd ring, he'd pick four stations where the super would be and he'd ring the district office at half nine where the super should be. He'd then ring the clerk and the clerk would be in. I want to speak to Superintendent uh, Ted Donahue, we'll say. Oh, he's just not here at the minute. Where is he? And Garvey would ring back and he had the super running up the stairs at half nine. In the morning, he, he was a different for timekeeping and all of that. He was unbelievable for, for timekeeping. In any event, uh, didn't Fianna Fáil Gael lose power and Fianna Fáil got into power. And before the election, there was a crime issue in Limerick and Jerry Collins, one of the most typical Fianna Fáil hacks you would get. He's a, he's a Limerick based, he's alive yet, I think. He was the Minister for Justice. <laughs> But there'd be a heave in the party or a divide. You'll burst the party, you know. And he had big influence on who got promoted and everything. Anyone who knew him would get on real well. Jerry Collins. And uh, uh, so so the, he was going around campaigning or shortly before it about crime. But he, he asked to meet the commissioner, Edmund Garvey, about crime. I don't I think it was that much crime, but he asked to meet him about crime. And... Uh, Garvey said, no, I only answer to the Minister for Justice, who was then Patrick Cooney, the Fine Gael man, and he wouldn't meet Collins, and Collins said, well, you'll meet me yet. He said, uh, you'll meet me yet. As soon as Collins got in, the sacked him. And there was a big hullabaloo then about Garvey suing and all that, and he got compensation. But the fact is, they did sack him, sack him and he got the compensation of the taxpayer. He didn't get it of Jerry Collins. Now, many weren't sorry to see Garvey going. He'd be looking for wee hairs on the guard's uniform, and things like that, a strict disciplinarian. I knew he was kicked out. <laughs> but I remember his picture coming up on the television. I was in some private house, nothing to do with the guards. And this man says, and he no unbelievable look on, look on him. That, that the fellow's a savage. Uh, yeah, he actually was a savage, that's what he was. But uh, some people loved him because of this thing of him building up the guard the club. And, oh, he did this and he did that. I don't give two dams what anyone does. The job of commissioner has nothing to do with that. It's a totally different job. Patrick McLaughlin then took over. And Patrick McLaughlin was involved in the phone scandal. There was a telephone scandal where Sean Doherty, an ex-guard himself, a minister for justice, tried to uh, bug Geraldine Kennedy and somebody else of the Irish Times. And McLaughlin provided the equipment and they were listening to the, the journalist talking. Uh, I'll, I'll post on the need who the other one was, but Geraldine Kennedy was the other one anyway. And McLaughlin had to go. McLaughlin had to go. Next came in was Lawrence Wren. Fine Gael, you see the, the austerity with Fine Gael and the more, less austerity with Fine Fall. And Larry Wren came in, a total disciplinarian, ruthless disciplinarian, another Garvey. Many people hated him, although some people said when he was a policeman down the south of Ireland, a superintendent, he had to do some tough things. There was even some guard tried to fire a shot at him or something. I don't know. He was very, very argumentative anyway, very austere. You'll get his picture there. Lawrence Wren. But the big thing was in 1983, now it says here he was a commissioner from 83 to 87. In 1983, see many of these had to go because their time was up, their age. In 1983, there was the Dorada Wood, the, the IRA held Don Tidy a captive in Ballinamore. And the guards were investigating and there was a good investigating going on. They were watching where he is. They knew he was stuck somewhere. He was actually stuck in a wood in a camp. There was a good investigation going on, there was good work going on, and Gareth Fitzgerald was the Prime Minister. I won't say who the Commissioner was at that time now, I don't think it was Cooney, but anyway, the point about it is, it's easy to find out, anyway, the date is, 19, is uh, this time, November 2000, uh, uh, 1983. Anyway, Wren was asked to hold off, not to attack. They had found out where they were in Dorado Wood, but Wren, uh, Wren was asked by the senior guards to give more time, another few days wouldn't matter. And Wren, in consultation with the government, refused, R-E-F-U-S-E-D. Wren would not give more time. Wren's answer was bullying, bullying, oh, bullying. Oh. And in the boat, and a, a soldier got killed and a young guard, Gary Sheehan, got killed. And I would put his blood, their blood, largely on Wren's, Wren and Gareth Fitzgerald. And uh, you can check yourself who was, who was the minister. I think maybe it was Cooney still at that time. Now, anyway, he uh, he just retired on age grounds in 87. And in came Eamon Doherty, 87 to 88. He was a year. 
I think he had a bit of a drink problem. He was a Donegal man. And he went to sent as a young police superintendent to America to learn about policing and how to do policing. And oh, he picked up all of the discipline stuff and dumped out all the rest. And he was in charge of the guard, guard the college. And that was a nightmare of a place. From 1964, I think he was the, he was the superintendent there. Or, and he was a chief superintendent. And it was, it was ruthless discipline that treated the guards, the young guards, like dogs. They forced a lot of guards out of the force. They couldn't stick what they were doing. Oh, don't we'll not go there now. Ruthless, ruthless, um, Nazi-type uh, uh, stuff. Now, again, he was big into sports. And he was stopped by a guard going home drunk one night, and he drove through the checkpoint and got into the station and got away. So he wasn't popular. Eamon Doherty, anyway, I think he's now dead as well. Eugene Crowley took over, and he was he was in there for three years, and he was he was an all right fellow. He was just uneventful. And Patrick J. Culligan uh, took over, uh, nineteen ninety one to nineteen ninety six. Uh, Cul 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 Culligan, all right fellow too. Yeah, I think he was he was he just he was normal as we say. And then came Patrick Byrne. Uh, I, I don't know what politics Culligan was, but Patrick Byrne was Fianna Fáil. I think I'm nearly sure. But uh, he was six ninety six to two thousand three, and. Uh, uh, he, he, he was relatively normal. He was fairly normal. Now, I'm going to tell two things that happened, but I won't have time here. We'll do a new video on that. The next one was Noel Conroy. Again, an ex-detective. Yeah, all right. I don't think there wasn't much said about him. Faulkner Murphy, 2007-2010. Yeah, he was, he, was, he, was, he was normal. And then Martin Callanan came in, 2010-2014. And he should have seen the writing on the wall with the Morris McCabe thing. He said they were disgusting, but they had them because they were squashing thousands of speeding things. What happened was there was an independent camera, a Gatso van, taking numbers and speed um, ratings, speeds of motors. And of course, the guards had no say, but it was the guards enforced it. So when the, the, when the person was found speeding, it went through the local guards and the guards were squaring them, were stopping them because they knew all these people and they weren't pushing these. It wasn't a great system. I'm not saying the rights are wrong, but McCabe said it was dangerous for to have that amount of non-compliance with the law. And he pushed and pushed it, and it went to open warfare and eventually a... Uh, uh, they couldn't fix it. They tried to, they, all they had to do was say to me, hey, what do you want us to do? Put in an office and put him running it. You know, we'd only there for a while, I'd give him promotion. But they didn't want to be told what to do. They weren't going to be told what to do. And eventually, <laughs> a judge ruled on it and Cannon had to go. He still, I'd say, has a liver over it. So he's still whinging about it. Then, oh, we'll put a woman in. Hey, we'll put a woman in. No, we don't sort of it. 214 That was the start of the woke. That was the start of the woke culture. Oh, she's a woman. Oh, she's a woman. And she was going to fix Morris McCabe. He was still going after him. She was going to sort it out. Not a snowball's chance in hell. She had no idea how to sort the problem. And she had to go as well. And they gave her a big job, I believe, in Tuzla. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Will you quit the husband with the superintendent, too? Oh, she's a woman. Oh, oh she's a woman. Oh, Francis Fitzgerald. Oh, oh, she's a woman. She was about as useless as the tits on my bull. That's all she was. Donald O'Kellan. Donald O'Kellan. Donald O'Kellan. I, I don't even remember that fella. He was only in there for a year. Donald O'Kellan. Oh, no, he was temporary. When, when, when Sullivan was forced to go, they took a while to, to put this fella in as a temporary man. No big deal there. And then Drew Harris, uh, uh, who was in the, serving in the police in Northern Ireland, his father was killed by, by Republican terrorists. I mean, so, that's, so that's all right. And he took over too. And he's a separate thing to talk about altogether but he is woke i'm afraid to say he's woke unfortunately and uh, that's so it is we're lucky we, we can get around it all so that's the basic history of the garda shikona and now you see Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil are all in government together they're, they're not they don't have enough votes because they wouldn't run in the country right and you have Sinn Féin now heading for maybe the major party in government and they're the people who shot the guard of the soldier, their own henchmen in the IRA, in um, in 1983. <coughs> See, shot Seamus Quaid, and shot um, guard Jerry McCabe. So that just shows you about politics. But I'm not making any big issue. Fianna Fáil was; uh, they were all born out of the terrorism and the violence of the state. And as an Irishman, uh, I can see where all of that came from uh, they would say they had to do it 
Some would say if they had a wait a while and they've got independence anywhere, anywhere. Anyway, I don't know. I'm not going to say that to you. So the point about it is that's a rundown now on the basic history of the Garda Shikona. A huge big force, even though it's a small country. In Britain, there's several for no commissioner would have to run it. It's supposed to be very tiring. You come in in the morning, there's a list there of six guards that have to be sacked. And of course, superintendents never get sacked, you know that, of course. But the six yards have to be sacked, and the commissioner will labour over that and think about it, and it's not an easy decision to make. Uh, and it's, 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 it's supposed to be very weird. I think it was that Carol man said it. He, 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 his daughter said it, it. He aged in the job. It is not an easy job. It's a highly responsible job, actually. It really is. Anyway, uh, that's the situation, folks, of 25 minutes. I hope you find that interesting. No harm to know it. And for young recruits, we'll have a look at some of the things that are in the guards and that and what you can expect. Okay, bye.